Every time I say that, the UFO people come on and say, ah, wait until this guy is shown up in six months when the new report is released. But this has been going on for 10 years and the new report has never really shown me up. Sean, do you have time for some audience questions and then some final questions from yours sure. truly? Okay, Let's do great. it. Great. Okay, so audience questions. So uh, one is uh, asking about your largest hope for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, is there a certain question or topic that is within the purview of the JWST that could be answered by them? You know, when I was at Caltech, I was contractually obligated to say nice things about LIGO. Yes. Because LIGO is a Caltech experiment. And now <laughs> I didn't I didn't have any difficulty doing that because LIGO is pretty awesome. Now at Hopkins, I'm contractually obligated to say nice things about JWST because literally I can look out my window yes. in this office I'm in right now at the Space Telescope Science Institute where JWST is is controlled from. And again, it's not a hard obligation to live up to because I think it's going to do a lot of wonderful things. Um, what I need to emphasize is I don't think there's any research question that I myself am working on or deeply interested in the JWST is going to help us with it all because I want to know what the fundamental laws of physics are at an even deeper level than we already understand them. And JWST is about the working out of the known laws of physics in astrophysical situations. It's about galaxy formation and star formation and supernovae and planets and all that stuff. And I need to really, really emphasize that that is really interesting and important, <laughs> even though it does not teach us anything about quantum gravity. It's okay. It doesn't need to teach us anything anything about quantum gravity right. to be interesting, okay? So when I say on the one hand, it's not gonna teach us anything about the origin of the universe of the Big Bang. And on the other hand, it's still worth doing. Oh yeah. For example, you know, uh, uh, exoplanets are something which as much hype as there has been around them, there should be more. It's really just amazing. You know, when I was in grad school, we didn't have any exoplanets. We didn't know about any <laughs> planets around other stars. And now we have thousands of them. And some of the, Things that we've learned about them have been a bit surprising, and I'm looking forward to more surprises. And JWST as a giant infrared telescope is going to be able to sort of look at starlight shining through the atmospheres of extrasolar planets and learn mm -hmm. about what those atmospheres are like, it, you know, in some crude way. That was not yeah. what it's optimized for, but it'll be a little bit. Come on, that's got it. That's just like, you know, something my young self would have would have flipped out over. Like, let's get excited about that. I think that's really, really fun. Yeah. And you had a podcast uh, not too long ago with uh, I think it was uh, was it Fisher of um, John, John Fisher. Johnson. Uh, say that yeah, yeah, John, yeah, Josh, John Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, good. Uh, so actually, I want to take the liberty of asking the host prerogative. So you talked about pan, uh, you talked about finding exoplanets, and and of course the hope that there'd be life on it. I I don't think we've ever talked about alien life. I, I don't know. It's a, something you talk about, but it's it's de rigueur nowadays in podcast world. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is uh, is whether or not since you are the master Bayesian uh, of, of all Bayesians that I know uh, in terms of explicating it, maybe not only believing in Bayesian approaches to probabilistic reasoning, but anyway, the fact is uh, in 1997, there was a, a, a press conference on the white house lawn and Bill Clinton was there and you can actually see it in the movie contact uh, with a uh, past guest on my show, at least Andrurian who would make a great guest for you, the wife, the widow of uh, the late great Carl Sagan. And she co-wrote the book contact on which the movie is based. And in that, they take a scene from this. Uh, uh, so that was 1997, 1998. They took a scene from the late 90, late 1996, when there was a declared announcement um, from a discovery of meteorite uh, relics in Antarctica, a possible respiratory, microbial respiratory byproducts or something like that. Now, that was actually, you know, vetted by NASA and had to be to be broadcast from the White House lawn. It was actually some articles are published in, in science and so forth, peer reviewed and everything. And that showed that there are meteorite activity that can come from Mars and land on the Earth at, at, at one thing. And then that life could persist potentially. And by the way, that's never been retracted formally. I mean, it's never been like there's been a retract. Oh, that we were wrong. It's just ambiguous. It hasn't been confirmed or refuted. That's it's pretty wrong. It's pretty wrong, by the way. <laughs> Uh, be that as it we may, we know that it's wrong. Yeah, the 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 fact occurs to me that, um, given that there is life on Earth, 
And given that it arose a few hundred million years after the origin of the Earth, it, we've had four billion years for these little chunks of rocks, which, by the way, you can win if you're one of the next 100 uh, subscribers to my mailing list, briankeating.com. I send out meteorites to people in America. All I can afford is to send out American meteorites uh, through the U.S. Postal Service, but gravity will deliver it uh, once you get it. Um, given that we haven't found life on Mars or on uh, any other evidence of life on Mars, is there some amount? Of, um, of Bayesian prior reasoning, that we can then diminish the probability of life being present throughout the universe. In other words, we often hear that as soon as life came on Earth, which you know we don't know how that came about, maybe it's panspermia, uh, maybe it's not, but kind of the fact that reverse panspermia can occur, we can kick tardigrades off of a chunk of the Grand Canyon and can go into space. How come, uh, can we use that to reason that life is actually not that abundant as many people think, and certainly not advanced technological life. Or am I, you know, is this not an appropriate way to view the problem? Well, I don't think we can go quite that far, but the fact that we do not see abundant, very obvious life on Mars or other bodies in the solar system, all else being equal, lowers our probability of life being ubiquitous in the universe. On the other hand, if your theory that you're trying to update is 1% of Earth-sized planets have life on them, then the existence of no life on Mars doesn't change your prior probability very much at all. And 1% right. of the planets out there would still be billions of <laughs> uh, places to have life out there in the universe. So. Uh, you know, I, I draw a big distinction between life and anything that you think of as advanced intelligent life, right? That's a very, very different question. Absolutely. I think that there are good Bayesian reasons to think that there are not that many advanced civilizations in our galaxy. That is something that we could have observed very, very easily, and we haven't. Yeah. And every time I say that, the, the UFO people come on and say, ah, wait until this guy is, is shown up in six months when the new report is released. But this has been going on for 10 years, and the new report has never really shown me up. So I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. Right. But that's very different than saying, is there simple unicellular life out there? That could be everywhere. That could be on Europa. That could be even, there could be even multicellular life on Europa. We don't know. Um, in the oceans of Europa, but we'll have to go look, you know, the best Bayesian does not get very far when you only have two or three data points. So we need yeah. to collect a lot more data. And the exciting thing is we're going to do it. That's kind of awesome. We're going to be updating our priors in a substantial way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think of nothing else that discovery in the late 1996 <clears throat> demonstrates that, you know, people think, oh, it would change humanity forever. If the discovery even of a microbe of slime mold on Proxima Centauri B would change forever, we'd have this community. I say, no, it wouldn't be. And there's proof that it would because no one, like 99% of the people that even heard about this in 1996 probably still think it was accurate or it could be true. And I don't think we've had this, you know, great kumbaya moment across humanity. Anyway, you don't have to respond to that. But but the the, um, the next question comes from a very good fan of yours and good friend of this show, Maya Benowitz uh, from Twitter. You can follow Sean on Twitter at Sean M. Carroll. You can follow me at Dr. Brian Keating on Twitter. Uh, she asks, extracting the universe from the wave function was a very nice talk. My question is this. If, in principle, whatever information behind the horizon can be recovered by holography, then why assume a finite dimensional Hilbert space? So I haven't seen this talk, but... Um... <laughs> well, there's a lot going on there uh, yeah. for the person on the street, so I'll try to unpack it there. Um, the the talk that I gave on extracting the universe from the wave function is an illustration of this philosophy that I already mentioned, that we should think quantum mechanically first about the universe. And we have this thing, even among professional physicists, where we have a classical theory of this or that field or string or what have you, and then we quantize it, right, to make a quantum theory. But the real world doesn't do that. The real world just starts as a quantum theory and then has a classical limit. So that's the program that is being pursued when I talk about extracting the universe from the wave function. Given a wave function and a way that it evolves, what is the classical thing that that represents? And part of the one of the things that I like to do in that talk, which is completely optional, but it makes my life easier, is I argue that the Hilbert space of the universe, which is just the set of all possible quantum mechanical wave functions. So it's a vector space, which means you can add wave functions together. That's all it really means. It's like X and Y, except instead of two dimensions, you have 10 to the 10 to the 122 dimensions. There's a lot of dimensions in, in Hilbert space. <laughs> Everyone gets a dimension. But that's still, that's still a finite number 10 to the 10 to the 122 is still not 
as big as infinity. And from the math methods point of view, that matters a lot. That really sort of does affect how you go about the analysis. So the existence of black hole entropy is not a problem for this point of view. It's a feature of this point of view. It is one of the reasons why we think that the universe only has a finite dimensional Hilbert space because a black hole, Stephen Hawking said a black hole is entropy. And his argument for that was actually pretty phenomenological in the physics sense. In other words, he didn't have an underlying deep theory. He was sort of not Ludwig Boltzmann. He was Rudolf Clausius. For those of you who are big fans of 19th century thermodynamic history, <laughs> Clausius is the one who invented the word entropy. But he didn't know what it was. You know, he knew what it did. Mm -hmm. And it was Boltzmann who eventually explained what entropy was later. And what Hawking did is closer to Clausius. Like he's explaining what entropy does without saying what it is in the black hole. Right. And we still don't know for sure. But the, you know, the leading idea is that it represents entanglement between what happens inside the black hole and what happens outside, quantum mechanical entanglement. And here is, here is where I would argue that the typical physicist on the street is cheating a little bit or not taking seriously enough what's going on. Mm -hmm. If you just take a region of empty space in quantum field theory, right? Quantum field theory is our best way of thinking about the world right now, the standard model of particle physics, QED, et cetera, they're all quantum field theories. There is an entanglement between empty space in quantum field theory in a region and the whole rest of the world. Everything outside the region, everything inside the world, the region is entangled. And therefore, you can calculate the entropy associated with this region. Do you know what the answer is, Brian? <laughs> no. <laughs> it is infinitely big. It's one of the divergences in quantum field theory, it, you know, because there's an infinite yeah. number of modes of a quantum field. They can be infinitely small or, or whatever. And so the fact that the entropy of the black hole is finite, even though there are good arguments that an entropy of a black hole is the most entropy we can fit into a region of space, finite is less than infinite. And that's telling us something really, really profound, which is that gravity is not a quantum field theory in mm. any straightforward way gravity is something more subtle than that i mean maybe it's a <coughs> sort of bizarre warped kind of quantum field theory so everything works out okay but the facts you get to the question you know the fact that the holographic principle suggests what it, what it suggests is the number of qubits of information inside a black hole is equal roughly speaking to the area of the event horizon uh, measured in Planck units. And so you can think in some sense, Lenny Susskind would say, of the information in a black hole as living just on or just beyond the event horizon of a black hole. Yes. But all I care about is that it's finite. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's perfectly compatible with everything I'm doing. It actually fits in very nicely. All right, good. Okay, two more questions from the audience and then four short ones from yours truly and then i'll let you go uh get that ayahuasca latte you've been craving all day um what is joy colbeck good friend of the show what's the difference between decoherence and wave function collapse oh there's a big difference um except that there's a relationship because decoherence can trick you into thinking that wave functions have collapsed decoherence is a process that happens smoothly and in a way that is absolutely 100% described by the Schrodinger equation, okay? So you have two different quantum mechanical systems. We usually call them the system, which might be like an electron or it might be a cat or whatever it is. And then you have the environment, okay? So all the photons in this room, all the stuff you're not keeping track of is the environment. And decoherence is just when the system and the environment interact in such a way as to become entangled. OK, mm -hmm. so there are many interactions between a system and environment that do not cause entanglement. The usual example I give is if you have a spin, you have a particle that is a superposition of spin up and spin down and you drop it. Professor Einstein in his uh, principle of equivalence experiment would tell you it's going to drop the same speed no matter whether it's spin up, spin down, or some superposition. Right. Yeah. So there's no is an interaction between the Earth and the spin, namely it's pulling it under the force of gravity, but there's no entanglement because it's not interacting differently with spin up versus spin down. Whereas if you shoot a polarized photon 
at that spin. Mm -hmm. It might interact. This is something Brian knows a lot better than I do, probably. Uh, it'll interact differently depending on if the alignment of the spin versus the polarization of the photon. So that's a chance for entanglement, and that would count as decoherence. So it's all perfectly smooth. It's just the Schrodinger equation, no magic there. But if you accept the many worlds formulation of quantum mechanics, then you would say when decoherence happens, the universe branches into different worlds where different parts of the wave function of the system are entangled with different parts of the environment. And to each person living in the world, it looks like the wave function has collapsed. Mm -hmm. That's the relationship between wave function and collapse. If you don't believe in many worlds, if you're Roger Penrose, yeah. then you think that wave functions just collapse. <laughs> like that's a thing, okay? And that's something that has nothing to do with decoherence. Uh, so to a many worlds person, decoherence leads to the appearance of wave function collapse. Mm -hmm. To a objective collapse person, they're unrelated. Ah, okay. <clears throat> Last question from my audience. This come we had many, many questions, but Sean's a busy guy. If you want to get your question answered, guaranteed, uh, join his Patreon for Mindscape. I'll put a link to that. I'm a patron. Um, Captain Brick, which I was going to call my firstborn uh, son. Uh, <laughs> Captain Brick asks, in many worlds, some branches are thicker than others. I find it easier to imagine that there are more copies of world A versus world B, depending on the thickness. Are these two views equivalent, or is the thickness of the branch, quote, baked into the theory? I'm not 100% sure, so hopefully you are. But uh, what, no. or, or, well, there's another question about conservation of energy and branches thickness versus branch thickness from a different listener. But if that one doesn't. Yeah, I, I find the thickness of the branches a useful way of thinking about it. It's just to those of you who know a little bit of quantum mechanics, it's the wave function squared. That's the thickness. So it's the amplitude for each branch squared. And that is what gives us the probability of finding ourselves on that branch once the branching happens. And the, the point is that the total thickness of the wave function of the universe remains constant, but as time goes on, branching sort of slices the universe into ever thinner branches. And mm. this visualization helps us understand things like conservation of energy, because the wave function of the universe overall isn't growing at all. But the number of universes is growing. And then we get into this very sticky philosophy problem, which is, do we have to wait until the branching happens to call the two different branches different universes? Or can we call them different universes even before the branching happens mm -hmm. and they are identical to each other? So I, I, I see the appeal of calling them different universes even before they're branched, but I don't think you can actually come up with a definition of universe <laughs> in which two things that are really identical to each other and doing the same things and part of the same physical system are two different universes. Mm. I don't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think that the, it's better to just bite the bullet and say that branching happens. And, you know, this is a situation where all the math is perfectly transparent. It all works out fine. Um, there's no real problem here of what the theory says. The only problems are understanding at an intuitive level, which is, which is admittedly uh, a big leap. <laughs>